Hello, this is the Fiction Nonfiction Podcast from Literary Hub, where we believe that every issue in your social media feed or on the evening news has already been tackled somewhere in literature. I'm Vivi Ganeshananthan, also known as Sugi, the author of the novel Brotherless Night. And I'm Whitney Terrell, author of the novel The Good Lieutenant. So I think it's safe to say, uh, since it's been a topic just a few times, that the show is very interested in seeing creative writing become more inclusive, and particularly for BIPOC writers. And things are definitely better than they used to be. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I, I think so. I don't know if there's really a way to measure this, like, you know, sort of in any sort of empirical sense. But what was it like for you to be a South Asian student in the Iowa Writers work Workshop in the early 2000s? Well, I mean, as I think you know, I loved the workshop. Um, I felt really free there in a way that I never really felt anywhere else, to be honest. But it wasn't inclusive enough at the time, I feel, especially in terms of race and ethnicity. And I was lucky to know writers like Yi and Lee, Asali Solomon, Kiki Petrosino, Daniel Evans, and to have, you know, Zizi Packer was my first workshop leader. And then, of course, I studied with Jim McPherson. But even so, sometimes it was really lonely because there was only one other South Asian writer who came through during my entire time at Iowa. And then a decade later, I was back as visiting faculty and it was unbelievably different. There were so many students of color and I was just thrilled. Well, as we've discussed, you know, on other episodes a lot, there's a lot of work has gone into that change. And fortunately, that change keeps coming, not just in the past few years, we've seen uh, some fantastic books on this topic. Matthew Salisis came on the show to talk about craft in the real world, but there's also Felicia Rose Chavez's The Anti-Racist Workshop, and she came and spoke at UMKC a little while ago, and Kavita Das's uh, Craft and Conscience. And now there's a really great new edition, Letters to a Writer of Color, out this week from Random House. We're thrilled to have the editors, Deepa Anapara and Tamor Sumro, with us today. Deepa Anapara was born in Kerala, South India, and her first novel, Gin Patrol on the Purple Line, won the Edgar Award for Best Novel, was longlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction, and was shortlisted for the JCB Prize for Indian Literature. It was named one of the best books of 2020 by the New York Times, the Washington Post, Time, and NPR, and is currently being translated into 23 languages. She previously worked as a journalist in India, and her reports on the impact of poverty and religious violence on children won the Developing Asia Journalism Awards, the Every Human Has Rights Media Awards, and the Sanskriti Prabhad Dutt Fellowship in Journalism. Deepa, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having us here. Such a pleasure to be here. And Tamor Sumro, uh, who was born in Lahore, Pakistan, he read law at Cambridge University and Stanford Law School. He has worked as a corporate solicitor in London and Milan, a lecturer at the university in Karachi, an agricultural estate manager in rural Sindh, uh, and a publicist for a luxury fashion brand in London. He has published a textbook on law with Oxford University Press and has written for Pakistani news outlets. His short story, Philosophy of the Foot, appeared in The New Yorker in January 2019. His short fiction has since been published in Ninth Letter and The Southern Review. His debut novel, Other Names for Love, was published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, and Harville Secker, in July 2022. He is currently a fellow at the Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, both of you, for having us. Um, I'm thrilled you're here. I just loved this book. Um, so each of the 17 essays in the book describes in one form or another the experience of being a writer of color and focuses on a specific aspect of the writing process or writing world. And I wonder if you can just tell us a little bit about how you two met and ended up working together on this project. Deepa, maybe you can start. Sure. So we met at a master's program in creative writing in the UK. And Taymor, in fact, was the very first person I spoke to on the course and at the university. And as we mentioned in our introduction, uh, both, you know, Taymor was born in Pakistan and I was born in India. And these two countries are often at loggerheads, uh, but like many Indians and Pakistanis who meet in the West, we very quickly became friends. And I was very grateful for that friendship because um, I faced quite a few difficult moments on that master's program, uh, primarily because it was quite white, the faculty were mostly white and the references were white, the, read, the writers we were told to read were white. And, um, our writing, which was set outside the West, was quite often misunderstood. And people would tell us that they couldn't engage with our writing. They didn't understand the non-English words that we used in our work. And 
or just that, you know, our stories were too digressive. And it was just really helpful to have another person to talk to about these subjects. And we were one of the few students of color on that program. And, um, you know, those particular questions that we had related to our craft, like how do we translate our culture or should we translate our culture, these were not addressed as part of the program at all. And I ended up talking to Tamur about these questions of craft that, you know, I had, which were very particular to me and which was not addressed in that program, which really discussed a very Western aesthetic. And I would say that the book really originated in those conversations that we had as students in the master's program. Would you agree with that, Timur? Yes, absolutely. You know, I feel so, so lucky to have met Deepa and to have met her so promptly in that program. You know, as she said, um, we were, you know, we were amongst very few students of color on the program. And you know, we were very much at the beginning of our writing careers and we were vulnerable, very vulnerable to the instruction and the feedback that we were getting, particularly from instructors, but also from peers. And so it was invaluable for me. It was so critical for me having Deepa both as an emotional support and as a technical support. And, you know, part of it, of course, was that she understood the context that I was writing about. And so my writing didn't have this sort of um, foreignness to her. But also, as she said, there were these technical questions that we were both grappling with, you know, um, we the book um, has a chapter on translation and translation comes up often in the in the collection and and uh, this was a question that you know was a challenge for me and so it was great to have Deepa there to, to you know to discuss how we how much we needed to translate and how to translate and you know how much of our culture we needed to translate what was integral to story and what wasn't and as she said, it was really those conversations that were the, the beginning of this book because we found so much community in each other and that community was really, really so important for us. And so trying to extend that community outwards. So can so, I ask when this was? At the top of the show, we were talking a little bit about my experience in an MFA program, which was at this point like almost 20 years ago. And when was this? 2015. Okay. Yeah. Just I have to... a sort of related question about workshops because that's where craft gets discussed, you know, a lot of times. And so America start, you know, was the first creative writing workshop started here. And there's a lot of MFA programs here. I've spent a lot of time in France because my wife's a French professor. They don't really do that so much, or if they do, it's very new. I don't know really what the status of creative writing programs are in the UK. I was kind of surprised when you said that you studied together there. And 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 do they exist in India or Pakistan? Um, we we have creative writing programs in India now, but I think maybe there's one at a university, so there are very few, and you really have to travel abroad to actually study because there are very few scholarships. Um, yeah, uh, Timur can say, uh, tell you about Pakistan. I mean, Pakistan is the same, really. I think that there is one. Um, I mean, I think in, 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 in the UK, of course, there are so many and they follow the American model. There is, I mean, in some ways, it's a kind of imperialism as well. You know, it's this is this is the model, I suppose, that has had the most um, that has been sort of practiced and, and it's sort of accepted as the as the as the way to teach. And so it's it's kind of been exported very successfully. It's my impression US. that it it seems like the U.S., the U.K., Australia, and South Africa, basically. Oh, really? South Africa has a lot of creative writing programs. There's like Cape that. Town and stuff. Um, huh. yeah, there, there's, yeah, there's places to study there, but it does seem like, yeah, as as you say, um, to describe it as a form of, yeah, cultural imperialism seems pretty accurate to me. Um, Pamor, your essay on origin stories is the first one in the book. Uh, would you read to us from it? Sure. Um, so, you know, this um, chapter that I wrote was really to kind of interrogate the stories that I was telling myself and other people about um, why I write and also where I thought my um, 
my you know sort of background in writing or experience in writing might come from and actually the essay turned out to be a really valuable way for me to interrogate those stories um so i'm reading from a couple of pages in the fiction of mine that has been most successful with industry gatekeepers is fiction that stays in my lane but on my writing program, I studied with three cishet white men for whom there seemed to be no lane at all, none that constrained them at least. One of them was writing a novel with a Japanese protagonist, another with an Iraqi, a third a Chinese. Their novels were published soon after we finished our degrees. Their writing and their success unsettled, even irritated me. Was it jealousy? It was a kind of jealousy that they were allowed to, that they had the audacity to tell any story they wanted as far, far from their lives with protagonists as different from themselves as they could possibly be. It made me wonder whether the power a writer has over their fiction is a power the writer has over their person. The imperative to stay in your lane, to write what you know, these are forces I think many writers must guard against, though some, those who are queer, those who are racialized, seem to be more vulnerable and more sensitive to its effects. The gatekeepers and the readers are not so easily conned by us, so that Elena Ferrante is presumed to be Lenu in her Neapolitan quartet, so that Monica Ali is presumed to write well only when she writes about Bangladeshi immigrants. By writing freely, each of the three men I studied with reminded me I had less power than he did, that his fiction, his person, was not constrained in the way that I was. Thank you. So, Tamar, you write in that piece about the fictions we create as an act of self-identification, and you tell, you retell some stories that you told about yourself when you were younger. And then in the section you just read, you touch on the conditions and form your most successful work has taken. And I wonder how those two ideas meet for you. Right. Um, you know, I think that for me, this essay, which was so much about interrogating the relationship between truth and lies and fiction. And, you know, um, the essay is also about con artists and and lying and lying is such a kind of it's such a loaded such a, a un, unequivocally negative word and in some ways I wanted to try to reclaim it um, and to think about you know how storytelling might be a form of um, you know, through storytelling, how we construct these identities for ourselves that engage with truth, that engage with falsehood, and that those stories become really a way to, those be, they, they become a sort of an initial lesson in, in the kind of storytelling that we might engage in later. So that for me, um, constructing my identity when I was younger, you know, uh, as, a, as a queer um, South Asian, growing up, you know, as a queer South Asian teenager in London, I felt so different. And in that, in my my attempts to assimilate or my desire to, to fit in, I ended up telling all of these stories about myself. And, you know, I, for so long, I, I, it, I felt as though that was a bad thing that I had done, that those stories that I told were, were somehow, it, that it, you know, it reflected negatively on me. And this essay was a way to try to reclaim that, to think of that actually as an education and to think uh, of that, of those stories as having some elements of truth in them and not having elements of truth in them in the way that a fiction might. And it's related to, we've talked about the, the term autofiction, which is a term that Margot Livesey has used on, in her essays and on the show. Is that sort of what you're talking about there? Um, I suppose in some ways, but maybe not only, you know, I think that, you know, that any fiction, even, you know, you think of something like Anna Karenina, that the way that Anna Karenina feels, feels true. Truthful, that we recognize it as true, whether, you know, we don't need to find an Anna Karenina right, who existed right. to know that the story is true. So that kind of truthfulness, the, a sort of mm. a non-literal truthfulness. 
Well, that idea of, of uh, you know, um, flickering between, you know, the self and fiction, you know, and, and that your personhood is sort of in that space, you know, appears in that essay. And there are ideas like this are sort of come up throughout the book, I thought. Um, so Madeline Thien's essay approaches structure as movement, and Amitabha Kumar writes that there's no authentic self if it is not a risky self. And Deepa, you write that my truth is mine alone and malleable. Can you talk a little bit about that theme as it runs through the book, the idea that more than security, a writer of color needs the freedom to change? Um, yeah, sure. So um, I think there's a lot of uh, there's actually this um, really beautiful sentence, I think, in Saint Jokada's essay, Saint Jokada's essay, where he talks about the process of envisioning ourselves, ourselves, and how that is a recursive process, and you know how you have to sort of imagine who you are when you're free. And um, when I read that, I realized that uh, how I see myself is often through the lens of others and especially through the white gaze. And I'm constantly telling myself that, you know, I'm challenging these limitations and uh, the expectations that others have about who I should be as a person of color and as a writer of color. And I realized that even in that process by which you're challenging those expectations, in some ways you're also being defined by them um, in a sense that, you know, if I'm saying I'm not who you say that I am. I'm also giving credence. The part to the, that, that when that someone's saying who you are is still in there, right? Yeah. yeah, that's exactly it. So I'm still being defined by that. And reading his essay, it reminded me that you know it's really important to think about who I am when I'm free of all those expectations. And I do think it's a theme that runs through all the essays because as you know, Temur uh, read from his essay where he talks about is actually successful when it stays in that so-called lane. And so we are expected to produce a certain kind of work. I think Tamima Anam also says that in her essay where she talks about, you know, as long as she was writing about Bangladesh, it was seen as fine. And the minute she wrote a funny book about a tech startup, uh, people had all sorts of questions about why she did that. And it was seen as a failure. So I think uh, it's good to all the essays, I think, remind us to be free of those sorts of expectations about what you know our writing as a person of color should be, and you know it's such a great gift to be reminded to move away from that, and that we can remake ourselves in the ways that we want to away from the white gaze. If that makes sense. Tamar, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I, you know, just to say really that it's it's a constant challenge though, you know, because of all of these pressures around us and so many of them, I think we end up, you know, end up within us too, within our psyches that are kind of pressing us into certain shapes and certain identities. And, you know, and, and then there are, and we say this in the book too, that there are rewards, I think, for the writer of color who reproduces tropes that make the reader, make the prize committee, make um, the editor, make the agent feel comfortable, that reinforce the value system that they already have. And 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 it feels really that it's 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 very challenging to write against those tropes, to write um to write into a space that's unfamiliar to that to, to these gatekeepers because um you know it's that that the audience you know it's 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 more challenging to find an audience i think in those situations i agree and understand totally with everything that you're saying i want to i have a question though like obviously i'm a, I'm a white writer i live in the midwest um and i like people think of me as being someone who writes about kansas city I think I could write about other things and people would allow me to do that, which is not the kind of pr problem that you're talking about, right? But I have, when I've tried to write and I've lived outside of Kansas City, I tried, you know, when I've tried to write about characters from the East Coast or something like that, where I've lived, I fuck it up and I feel more comfortable, <laughs> you, know, you know, in this one place that I happen to feel like I have like real knowledge of. And I wonder if that ever applies when you're thinking about like writing are there times when you're like, no, I feel more comfortable here or in this place or no? I mean, I think that so much of writing ends up being this sort of like this, this game with yourself, giving yourself the conviction 
um, to believe that you can tell this story. And then of course, all of our own prejudices and biases end up, you know, they end up these kind of filters through which we see the world. And so I can, you know, I, I feel the same. I, I, of course, I feel, I feel comfortable in a way writing about Pakistan, although I, you know, I've grown up, I've spent you know, more of my life outside Pakistan than I've spent in Pakistan. But in some ways I feel comfortable writing there because it feels like a home that I sort of chose, but also that was given to me. So in terms of my own expectations and external expectations, it feels like a comfortable space to write within. But I think that maybe precisely for that reason, it's it's good. It's good for me. And maybe it would be good for you too, Whitney, to like- Well, you know, I keep to, trying to, to write to... novels set in New York and then they just get thrown away, but maybe it's just a way of visiting <laughs> New York for me. Um, It's like, it seems like some of the trouble is that it would be to one's huge advantage to understand the expectations that one is working against, but then those are also so deeply in one's subconscious. And there's like a part of the subconscious that one doesn't actually want to disturb in the pursuit of writing because it's actually best left alone. Like sometimes, you know, I don't know, you go into an interview, I, we may be doing this to you right now. And you're just like, I don't, I, it would be best for me and for you if we didn't talk about that, you know, like, and and I don't know, like there's a part of my psyche where I'm like, I'm like, whose expectations? Does it actually benefit me to know? And like, so in what way is the desire to like decolonize the self and decolonize the imagination like directly at odds with the part of the subconscious that you need to like make shit up? I'm not sure that's a question. <laughs> All right, I'll just go on to the next question then. Okay. Um, that was Sugi's statement. Um, that was my existential despair. More directly <laughs> political pieces. Um, just one piece in here uh, on violence is a conversation between Ladifa Muhammad, who we've had on the show, and Leila uh, Abu Leila. Um, how did that, how did it end up in that format? So when Temur and I were doing our PhDs, we had invited Nadifa to talk about writing violence to um, students who were studying writing at the time, because that subject is um, quite difficult for many of us, uh, because our lives can be shaped by conflict or by war or violence. But there's, on the other side, there is a tendency to associate you know, people of color with violence. Um, th there are those huge stereotypes about um, the kind of violence that people of color are capable of. And you know, from my own, um, some historical research that I'm doing, I've been reading British travel narratives from the 19th century, and they fill with stereotypes about how you know people of color in the Asian and African continent they're savages prone to violence. So you know there is a huge question that burden of representation when you know you're writing violence um, in your own countries. And so, for instance, am I uh, contributing to those stereotypes? And um, so, if I say uh, you know if I portray a South Asian man as violent, am I saying something about South Asian masculinity? So there is a tendency to extrapolate you know from your character and apply that to a whole um, country or a community of people. So um, we asked Nadifa to speak about those challenges and uh, she was really articulate. And so when we were talking about the book, it was really natural for us to approach her first. And uh, incidentally, she said that she didn't want to write an essay about the subject and what she really wanted to do was to speak to another writer and um, figure out how they approach the subject so that it would be more of a conversation in which, you know, through their questions and answers, uh, more would be revealed about that uh, subject of writing violence and all the challenges within that. So it was a conversational format that she chose and she approached Leela Blela and who agreed to be interviewed. And I think, you know, we have as a result, a really deeply reflective conversation and in which both writers are talking about their own works and the responses they've had from their readers and which I found to be an incredible comfort just to know that other writers go through these same problems and realize how they are handling that. And I feel like that conversation contains like maybe one of the best examples of kind of what I, the kind of conversation that I'm looking for that relates to craft and, and being a writer of color and particularly pertains, there's a bit that pertains to faith. And I feel like I've also heard from writers who are religious that they feel like there's not enough space for them, particularly if they're not sort of from dominant religious identities. And, and Leila Abuela um, in the conversation compares herself to secular Muslim writers. And she, she writes frequently about Muslim characters in Islam and says, 
The difference is that I write about Islam as a valid faith affecting the characters' actions and perspectives rather than a culture or a tradition, which I thought was such an amazing distinction and really just important to say that it, she was right for her character's faith as motivation and then not like setting or, you know, color in the sense that a newspaper reporter would say it. And it's also like a way um, from a craft standpoint that she's resisting what Charlene Teo in one, in, in one of the other essays refers to as the touristic. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, you, you know, I, I, oh, sorry. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, I was just going to say you should, you should answer the question. Yeah. You know, I think what I loved in this and I, what I loved as well in the way that you'd read it, Sugi, as well, is that, you know, it, it speaks to the way in which, um, you know, we're writing about lives that are integrated and that are complex. And these aspects such as faith are entirely integrated into the lives of our characters, the people that we're writing about. And I think that there is a way in which um, a Western audience can see, can, can you know, see these 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 elements as as a backdrop. So it's it's really like, oh, I'm going to imagine myself, the Western reader, in this situation, and religion is a backdrop, is a sort of is like the heat or like the dust or like the color, and and what she's speaking about, which I think is so um, so so critical, is that you cannot you cannot separate lives out like that and 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 i suppose also the worry that maybe that that sort of that the that way of separating lives out is um a method of reading that is applied perhaps to our characters or our text that is not applied let's say to the story from new york where every element of that life is considered to be you know sort of holistic or you know um, motivations are coming from everywhere in this extremely integrated way i think you know if it's easy to understand that point if you think about the way that Graham Greene is read you don't read Graham Greene without understanding catholicism or read Flannery O'Connor without thinking about the way and taking seriously the way that she's thinking about Catholicism, it's not color, it's the way that the, the characters' minds are structured, and not only that, the way that the author's mind is structured, you know, and that seems very important. And I totally agree that doesn't happen with other, you know, non-Western religions when you're looking at it from particularly from an American critical perspective. Um, okay, I have to find my place now. Okay, um, I think we're on, yeah, okay, three, two, one. In uh, the essay um, on art and activism, Miriam Gerba writes about her experiences reviewing the novel American Dirt, which was a very famous, you know, uh, uh, book that came out. I don't know when it, well, well, I have to check the essay to see when it came out. She's also resisting the touristic. Um, and I felt that this essay, if I feel like it came out like before the pandemic, like, and then I lost some time there during the pandemic or something like I that. I think it might've been 2019. Right at the, right before. Sorry. Um, and I felt that- uh, sorry. American Dirt, sorry, American Dirt came out in January 2020. Yeah, right it, there. So right okay. before the pandemic. I right remember. before. Yeah. Um, anyway, I felt that this essay was striking a blow to the idea that art shouldn't be political or have an agenda. Um, and that's an idea that, of course, has a greater impact on minoritized writers than others. So could you just talk about that, this piece and how you decided to put it in the book? Um, why don't you start us off? Yeah. yeah, because, you know, I worked as a journalist and I was really the reason I became a journalist was at that time I was really idealistic and I wanted to write about this very inequitable society that I was living in in India. And so, you know, it's really in my fabric of my being, I think, this question of being political. But then when we were studying for a master's and often in reviews, um, you know, being political is seen as um, as a bad thing. That's you know, you're only meant to entertain, and you're not meant to be political. And if you're, you know, you're not meant to be overtly political, and you're not really um, show that you're, you know, you're aligned with a particular ideological position, for instance, as the writer, um, which I understand, of course, you know, um, characters are are what really matters in the novel. But it's in some ways, it's also a paradox, I find, because so many readers come to our books to, you know, actually learn about the country. So I know people read my novel, for instance, to learn about India. So it's not just, uh, you know, they approach it as not just fiction, but also something that will educate them. 
And at the same time, they'll complain that, you know, a novel is too political or the setting is too complex and it's hard to follow. Um, so, you know, in, as a writer of color, I think, you know, we have to be political then not too political. We have to entertain, but also educate. And there are all these sorts of imperatives which can be really challenging. And so we did want to include essays in the book on negotiating these really sort of tough questions and how we can be political in our art and also be unapologetic about it. And it can also be a part of our life and something that we do alongside our writing. And so how do you manage those, you know, those multiple selves that we have to be, um, you know, not just a writer, but also an activist. So we approached Miriam to, um, write this essay because she felt, because we felt that, you know, um, she was in a position to do so. And, you know, she had that experience. I mean, Sugi, you yeah. had to negotiate. We've talked about this with your, with um, Brotherless Night. You know, there's a whole Sri Lankan political history there. And you have to think about how much you're going to explain to the reader who the reader is going to be. Is this a Sri Lankan who's reading this? Is this an American who's reading this who doesn't know the history? And I know that you've worked hard on thinking about all of those things. Yeah, I wish I'd had this book before. <laughs> um, but yeah, to, yes, tune into the YouTube channel for my enthusiastic nodding during people's last answer. Um, yeah, I mean, for sure, all of those, right? Like, there are absolutely people who are like, your novel is so educational. And there is a kind of reader who can come to a book like that without feeling, without being like a voyeur, right? Like, there's a kind of... Um, person who's like, I'd love to learn about your beautiful culture, which is like, and the phrase beautiful culture, like I'm purposely choosing because it makes me cringe. And then there's a person who's just like, I find this, I find this really interesting because it involves other people. Um, and that's a kind of reader I like, I don't mind educating because I feel that that relationship could be flipped and I could learn from them. And so the power imbalance doesn't feel so, um, so fraught. Um, yeah, I mean, so we, wait, you're certainly, certainly correct. And I think, you know, for people who are are working on uh, navigating those multiple selves and thinking about, you know, I was reading this essay and remembering when I was sitting in workshop as an MFA student and the other student who sort of said, um, as I was silent in my workshop, you and your agenda to me, um, as I was sitting there wow. unable to respond. <laughs> and I was like, wow, you're not wrong, buddy. Um, and which was, I mean, which was, fine with me but I think like I think I don't know like I was able to not listen to him but I think your point earlier about sort of the way in which when we enter these conversations we're also re often really vulnerable is just so well taken and I think you know here Miriam was so well known for um, you know I think most of our listeners are familiar with kind of the American dirt debate which was about appropriation about uh, undocumented persons about um you know, writing from a community that um, the writer wasn't from and, and sort of beyond that. Should we explain what that book is about but to educate our, <laughs> our listeners who may not know the history of all that stuff? Yeah, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty large detour. So I'm trying to do the quick and dirty. But like, okay. you know, so, some of the some of the criticism was simply about the notion that it had been done badly. Right. Like, well, but it's a book about right. Mexican immigrants written by a white writer who then was marketed and got a lot of publicity and was pushed as a as a literary masterpiece and this essay is, is a is a is a critique of how that book was created and what was wrong with it and all of the backlash and the backlash to the backlash and the backlash yeah. to the backlash and the, the whole accordion down of of that um you know to the writer's husband to you know the writer pointing out that their husband was undocumented and then people being like irish and undocumented um right. and you know right. kind of all of the all of the um all of, all of that debate, which is which is very rich and which you can find, um, we'll link to some information in our show notes about that. But Miriam kind of, I first saw her name when she was writing about American Dirt, which, you know, for all of this criticism was a bestseller, absolutely, right. um, did really well. And so it seems like advancing this kind of critique, freeing people also to be political is so important. Oh, I just wanted to, to pick up on the point you said, Sugi, about how a student, a peer of yours at a workshop had had said you and your agenda and I think that what it does is it you know I think when I was when I was um reading Deepa's work first that my my um initial response was this is too political and it's and part of that was because of this lesson I had been taught that fiction should not be political but but you know what that does that 
rule conceals to us that all fiction is political. It's just that our politics is somehow visible in a way that the politics in, say, American debt is invisible to people because it's reinforcing a, a, a value system that they already that they already agree with. And I think that what was so interesting to me in Miriam's piece and in in when we spoke to Miriam too is that we expected her to say. To, to advocate for activism. And actually she didn't do that. You know, when we spoke to her as well, she was talking about the immense burden on her of just of just writing this piece saying this book is not very good, that actually she lost her job as a result, you know? Right. And that um and that, you know, for us to be activists, um, the cost is very high. So while we're talking about the political, of course, nothing is more political than maybe the idea of ideal conditions of writing, uh, which was your topic, Deepa, and and the concluding essay of the book. I wonder if you could read from that piece for us. Sure. So as you said, Sugi, my essay is really about an aspect of writing that I've struggled the most in my life, which is really finding the time and the mental bandwidth to write. And there is a part of me that's always hoped that I could spend weeks at a quiet writing residency with food delivered to my door. And unfortunately, it's never happened. And um, I wrote my first published novel in very difficult circumstances. Um, you know, I was grieving and this essay is really an attempt to answer the question, can you write in conditions that are less than ideal and how do you do so? Uh, so the essay is composed in fragments. So I'm going to read from um, the 12th and the 13th fragment. 12, my husband loses his job a month after I accept a place on the master's program. Our circumstances are such that a year in which neither of us earns money is untenable. I switch to studying part-time so that I can work. My husband finds another job, but it seems the universe, a higher power, a belligerent ancestral spirit, the curse my mother warned us about, whatever I choose to call it, wants me to stop writing. And it is not asking this of me with tact or grace. It's a trope in horror films that the frightened character will leave their place of safety to investigate the source of their disquiet, always to their detriment. On the train to the university, I wonder if I am this character. Outside the window, the scenery is serene. Rolling green hills, bales of hay scattered across yellow fields, the occasional bright red face of a pheasant. Perhaps it's not the universe I fear, but the absurdity of my enterprise. In the classroom, I can't hide my writing. I will be exposed, and it will be a relief to know I'm not a writer. Then I'll be forced to find another way to be in this world. 13. Chico Conrad Kafka. The gods at the university are white and often consumptive, though only I seem to be attentive to this fact. Mythology is mostly Greek. I workshop the beginning of my second novel and a tutor suggests I read, uh, sorry, I'm just going to go again, one, two, one, one, three, two, one. I workshop the beginning of my second novel and a tutor suggests I rewrite it from the perspective of a character who doesn't exist on the page. I shell the novel whose first draft I managed to complete before the course began in between my retail and copy editing jobs, waking up to write when the sky was still black until the sun lightened the east. Acquaintances ask how I'm faring in a classroom with those half my age. Are in prodigies 25 most? I need weeks to write what takes the young people hours. I tell someone I met on a short writing course. Were you born with mo what most of them had, she asks. It's only then that I truly appreciate the workings of privilege. Where I grew up, we learned to carve our chests with textbooks and walked with our heads bowed, afraid of the glances of strangers, especially men. Where I, where I live now, I wear the drabbest of clothes, unwilling to stand out and risk more hostility than what the color of my skin already evokes. Is it any surprise then that there's always a gap, an abyss really, between what I want to say and how I say it? Thank you so much. Um, that piece is so beautiful. And it's not just a call to action, but a kind of statement of solidarity about fear and failure and grief and imperfection. I think of those two as a kind of creative freedom. And there are multiple pieces in the book that that touch on that, that allow kind of a space for inconclusiveness, which is, I think, maybe why this is one of my 
favorite recent books that I've read on writing. Um, I want to thank you both so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it and want to encourage our listeners to pick up this book, which is called Letters to a Writer of Color. Um, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you both.